family values between neoliberalism and the new conservatism by melinda cooper this is chapter four um the first half so part one the return of inherited wealth asset inflation and the economic family the inheritance of property can be interfered with more readily than the inheritance of talent but from an ethical point of view is there any difference between the two Yet many people resent the inheritance of property and not the inheritance of talent. Um, that was a quote from Milton and, Ro and Rose Friedemann um, from a book called Free to Choose. It was a dumb quote. In 1979, the conservative legal scholar Mary Ann Glendon published an influential and subtly alarmist article reflecting on the demise of the family as an economic institution. Recent changes in both family and property law, she suggested, pointed to the declining but not disappearing importance of the family in the determination and transmission of wealth, rank, and status in society, a change she saw reflected in the diminishing impact of inheritance in shaping social mobility. In support of her thesis, Glendon drew heavily on the work of Yale legal scholar Charles A. Reich, who famously argued that government largesse in the form of social insurance, welfare, and public service contracts was steadily taking the place of private property in the allocation of income and assets. With the post-war expansion of government intervention into more and more areas of private life, both citizens and corporations found themselves increasingly dependent on income and wealth transfers from the state. Translating this thesis back into the idiom of family law, Glendon predicted the inevitable demotion of private family wealth as a determining factor in social class. As social security and other forms of welfare distributed income from richer to poorer, the transmission of wealth through inheritance would inevitably lose its overriding significance in the shaping of social destinies. Glendon's intuition was corroborated by contemporary property law scholars who found that by the late 1970s, traditional methods of family wealth transmission via the law of wills, trusts, and estates remained in relative use among the upper percentile of wealth holders but were of declining importance for the middle classes whose economic security increasingly derived from non-inheritable forms of income, such as wages and social insurance. It also appeared to find confirmation in empirical studies that showed that income and wealth inequalities had steadily declined for three consecutive decades following World War II, with a considerable intensification of these redistributive trends in the 1970s. For Glendon, however, what was at stake here was much more than a shift in forms of wealth and income distribution. Glendon understood the decline of inheritance to be intimately and ominously related to the rapid liberalization of family law that had taken place in the late 1960s, a veritable legal revolution that had in short order seen the introduction of no-fault divorce, the erosion of legal distinctions between legitimate and illegitimate children, and the partial recognition of non-marital mar non relationships. Like many conservative commentators writing in the 1970s, a decade of tumultuous reform in both family and welfare law, Glendon believed that the enormous expansion of social welfare that had taken place after the New Deal was responsible for under undermining both the economic and moral role of the private family. In this and other publications, she insisted that the waning importance of inherited wealth testified to the disintegration of the family itself. At first glance, Glendon's assertion that social welfare had contributed to the decline of the family appears counterintuitive. The American New Deal was inseparable from the racial and sexual normativity of the, wage, of the family wage. Its various actu actuarial programs identified the white male industrial worker as the standard wage earner and demographic norm around which all income redistribution was to be statistically calibrated. In the words of Abraham Epstein, one of the early progressive architects of the New Deal, 
the American standard assumes an, a normal family of man, wife, and two or three children, with a father fully able to provide for them out of his own income. This standard presupposes no supplementary earnings from either the wife or young children. The wife is a homemaker rather than a wage earner. The needs of this family must be considered paramount. The practical effect of the New Deal family wage system was the almost total exclusion of African American women and men from social welfare programs. The relative inclusion of white women as either dependents of a male breadwinner or beneficiary or beneficiaries of stigmatized public assistance. And a rigorous assertion of heteronormativity as the condition of inclusion in all state welfare programs. Yet it is true that by the late 1960s, the link between the social wage and family normativity was becoming increasingly strained due to the changing profile of the workforce and the rise of new political movements combining feminism, civil rights, and welfare activism. By 1960, for example, Social Security had been extended to cover almost the entire workforce and now included farmers, domestic workers, nurses, and teachers. Agricultural and service occupations whose original exclusion had heavily penalized women and African Americans. In 1966, Johnson succeeded in significantly raising benefits as part of his efforts to wage a war on poverty, and in the high inflation period of the early 1970s, President Nixon introduced far-reaching and progressive reforms to Social Security when he indexed benefits to consumer prices. It was the latter reform in particular which sustained the fortunes of the working and welfare classes in a period of spiraling price inflation. By the 1970s then, the New Deal's major social insurance program, Social Security, had expanded in quantitative terms to include both women and African Americans. Fordism's non-normative subjects, and to keep pace with rising wages. But the reforms of the period were not merely quantitative in nature. As we saw in Chapter 3, a series of legal challenges mounted in this era steadily eroded the power of state welfare agencies to attach, to attach welfare benefits to particular family forms, and police the morality of welfare recipients. In public assistance programs ranging from AFDC to public housing, the Supreme Court repeatedly struck down the panoply of written and unwritten rules that had served to enforce sexual normativity throughout the Fordist era. Divorced or never married women could no longer be discriminated against in the allocation of welfare benefits. Unmarried women on welfare no longer had to abstain from sexual relationships in order to receive assistance. Public housing residents could no longer be expelled for allegations of immoral conduct, and for a brief moment, the public housing lists were opened to, cohabit to cohabiting heterosexual and homosexual couples. In light of such radical reforms to the family wage then, Glendon was perhaps justified in discerning a connection between the late Fordist expansion of welfare and the demise of traditional moral norms. When she spoke of the declining but not disappearing importance of the family, what she had in mind, it seems, was not the classic Fordist family, whose sexual normativity was inscribed in the very form of the male breadwinner wage, but the challenge to normativity represented by late Fordist social movements. In a context where traditional configurations of family were being contested, and income redistribution was rapidly undermining the importance of private wealth, it may well have seemed plausible to conclude that the family as a moral institution and conduit for wealth transmission was in terminal decline. Published in 1979, the tone of Glendon's argument is one of confident, if ominous, prediction. She writes as if she were discerning incipient trends that were destined to reveal themselves more fully in the long term. More than three decades later, however, the scenario described by Glendon appears almost unrecognizable. Thomas Piketty is only the most prominent of theorists to, observed, to have observed that private inherited wealth has reemerged as a decisive factor in the shaping of social class after a relative but significant period of decline in the post-war era. Paradoxically, perhaps, the presumption of meritocracy has flourished in the neoliberal era where popular economics celebrates the virtues of individual risk-taking 
the accumulation of fortunes from leveraged debt and extravagant returns to investments in skilled labor or human capital. Yet the empirical data on wealth, redis- on wealth distribution suggests that inheritance is almost as decisive at the beginning of the 21st century as it was in the 19th. This phenomenon also and, inevit- and inevitably entails the re- reassertion of the private family as a critical economic institution and a portal of social legitimacy. The fact that marriage and family formation have become the overriding concern of queer politics, the claim axiomatic among American social policy theorists that marriage is now a marker of class and a means to social mobility, the fact that the recreation of the private family unit has become a key ambition of welfare policy, all of these trends point to the resurgence of the family as the essential vector for the distribution of wealth and status. How and why did private family wealth acquire or resume such overwhelming importance in such a short period? And what is the relationship between neoliberalism and the legal institution of inheritance? The explanation I offer in this chapter differs from that of Piketty in that it attributes the reassertion of inherited wealth to political processes that could have unfolded otherwise, rather than bioeconomic laws that, in the long run, can only ever be interrupted or forestalled. At the time Glendon published her article in 1979, the United States was on the cusp of a regime change in monetary and fiscal affairs that would profoundly reshape the economic politics of the family. The so-called monetarist counter-revolution orchestrated by the incoming chairman of the Federal Reserve, Paul Volcker, brought to a halt the expansionary fiscal policies of the post-war Keynesian state and turned inflation targeting into the prime objective of central bank policy. Over the following years, the new monetary and fiscal policies adopted by the government and Federal Reserve would serve to rehabilitate the value of financial assets at the expense of wages and welfare, turning asset appreciation into a predictable feature of neoliberal economic life. In more or less overt ways, this paradigm shift was motivated by the sense that the interests of investors, along with the large family fortunes they amassed, were threatened by the expanding budgets of the welfare state. What I want to suggest here is that the question of family wealth and its decline was central to the political struggles of the period, although sometimes expressed in the most ambiguous of fashions. It is now commonplace to characterize the neoliberal subject as one impelled to embody the qualities of the investor. Whether one actually owns any financial assets, it is argued, neoliberalism enlists the subject into an effective culture of investment that defines the self as an asset or human capital. In the words of Gerald Davis, 21st century America defines investment as the dominant metaphor to understand the individual's place in society and a guide to making one's way in the new economy. George Bush referred to this nascent system as an ownership society, but its denizens were more like investors or even speculators than owners. As financial returns take precedence over long-term industrial investment, it is further suggested neoliberalism defines psychic reward in terms of asset appreciation rather than corporate profit or wages from labor. As Michel Ferrer puts it, our main purpose is not so much to profit from our accumulated potential as to constantly value or appreciate ourselves, or at least prevent our own depreciation. Without wanting to contradict or abandon these arguments, I wish to highlight the equally important role of inheritance in channeling the investment politics of the neoliberal era, The monetary and fiscal interventions performed by the neoliberal state from Ronald Reagan onward have indeed rehabilitated the value of financial assets that were rapidly depreciating in the 1970s. But in so doing, they have also restored the economic role of the private family in the transmission of wealth. As the sociologist Yuval Elmelech reminds us, the distribution of of financial assets is much more closely correlated to family background than our wages. Assets are inheritable in a way that professional status and wages are not. When the price of assets appreciates against stagnant wages and welfare, then, 
it is almost inevitable that family wealth will assume a decisive role in shaping and restricting social mobility. If there is a culture of asset appreciation, as political economist Jan Toporowski claims, it is one that is necessarily linked to the legal institution of inheritance. Class inflation and the erosion of inherited wealth. Marianne Glendon understood the, the decline of the private family to be linked in complex ways to the redistribution of wealth and income made possible by the welfare state. These redistributive trends had been in train since the New Deal and had accelerated after World War II as rising wages, social insurance benefits, and public investment in education steadily eroded income inequalities between rich and poor. Yet there is good reason why conservatives such as Glendon and others be became obsessed with the moral dangers of wealth redistribution at the end of at the end of the 1970s. The rising inflation of the 1970s, decreed as a universal catastrophe for all social classes, had in fact greatly amplified the steady but not spectacular redistributive trend of the post-war era, compressing wealth and wage inequalities as never before in American history. In an article exploring the effects of inflation on redistribution, the Brookings Institution economist Joseph Minerick found that since wages and welfare for the most part kept pace with the consumer price index, the poor and middle class did not lose much through inflation, and in some cases they made considerable gains. Those who benefited most from inflation were the middle income homeowner, homeowners who had borrowed to purchase housing. With fixed mortgage repayments and interest rates, the indebted homeowner saw his mortgage debt depreciate in value as the price level, including that of housing, went up, meaning that the burden of debt seemed to vanish with time. Even renters were not overly burdened by inflation as wages tended to keep up with rent increments. But Minerick also refuted the common assumption that low-income households, those that derived most of their income from government transfers, had been hardest hit by inflation. The effect of rising consumer prices on the welfare classes, he observed, was offset by the fact that most welfare programs were adjusted to inflation. After Nixon's reforms, Social Security was indexed to inflation on an annual basis. In-kind transfer programs such as food stamps were recalculated every six months, and those that covered the price of existing services such as public housing, Medicaid, and Medicare were implicitly indexed to inflation. By contrast, inflation seriously eroded the wealth of the top decile and centile of households, those whose wealth was invested in financial assets such as stocks, bonds, or real estate holdings, and whose income derived primarily from interests, dividends, or rents. Throughout the 1970s, wealth holders were at a loss to find safe avenues of investment that would protect their assets from long-term depreciation. Wage and consumer price inflation translated into financial asset deflation and therefore posed a serious challenge to the forms of wealth accumulation traditionally favored by the rich. The real value of corporate stock had been falling steadily since the mid-1960s, while bondholders found themselves earning low, if not negative, real interest rates. As inflation kept spiraling upward, a cloud of uncertainty hovered over the future of long-term investments, such as treasury bonds, while investors who moved into short-term treasury bills in the hope of finding a safer alternative discovered that their returns were intermittently negative. By the end of the 1970s, bondholders were in revolt, demanding an inflation premium on interest rates to protect them from the, de from the depreciation of principal. Free market economists insinuated that inflation was a form of state-sanctioned fraud, a covert tax designed to extort wealth from investors and transfer it to the lower classes. Pointing to Minerick's findings, the Reagan-era ideologue George Gilder described the 1970s as the Great Depression of the Upper Classes and denounced Arthur, Burns federal, Arthur Burns's Federal Reserve 
for conducting a war against the rich. The redistribution of wealth was real enough. The economist Edward Wolfe found that wealth concentration fell sharply between 1972 and 1976, due primarily to the depreciating value of stocks and bonds owned by the top wealth holders. Inflation. Inflation, he concluded, had acted as a redistributive tax that greatly intensified the progressive tendencies of the post-war era. But inflation, or but if inflation was denounced as an extortion of private wealth, it was also widely perceived as an attack on the peculiarly familial forms of wealth transmission that had long sustained the reproduction of class. Alongside the highly racialized rhetoric of lower class family crisis that flourished in the 1970s then, a parallel picture emerged of the rise and fall of the great American patrimonial family. Trustees beware, intoned one legal scholar who went on to observe that if times have been tough for investors generally, they have been worse for trust beneficiaries and other recipients of inherited wealth. Another expert in estate law pointed to the growing disinclination of the rich to bequeath wealth to future generations in a context of general asset price depreciation. Even a skilled acquirer and dedicated accumulator of wealth may find that his inclination to converse or to conserve wealth for his own retirement and for transmission to dependents and successors is affected by the inability of his investments to keep abreast of inflation. But it was Gilder who offered the most ex extravagant picture of upper class family decline. His Regan era bestseller, Wealth and Poverty, performed a rhetorical tour de, for de force by linking the corruption of the wealthy American family with the amoral counterculture, and this in turn with the perceived crisis of family values among the welfare poor. The great secret of the American gentry is downward mobility. Rich people who inherited and attempted to husband their wealth through the last five decades tended to see most of it wither away. Many who lived off of capital found their capital dwindling rapidly and their income from it shriveled by inflation and taxes. Many saw their children enter the professions and live moderately and well, but they then had to watch their grandsons grow hair to their shoulders, drop out of expensive schools financed by disappearing family wealth, and dabble in careers in art and carpentry interspersed with unemployment checks before they grabbed a briefly open slot in government bureaucracy from which to instruct the poor in the ways of upward mobility. At the beginning of the 1970s, fears that the wealthy American family might be under threat from inflation were accentuated by the simultaneous efforts of progressive tax reformers to increase the burden on large estates. During the 1972 presidential campaign, the left-wing Democrat George McGovern proposed to raise the estate tax to 100% on gifts or inheritances above half a million dollars. It was in response to this specific and credible threat that neoliberal economists first launched themselves into the estate tax debate, developing an elaborate account of the mutually beneficial relationship between private investment and the familial transmission of wealth. Virginia School neoliberals Gordon Tullock and Richard Wagner argued that the ability to pass on one's wealth was a necessary stimulus to investment and therefore warned of the deadening effects of the estate tax on private enterprise. And in a strange inversion of, of the argument from meritocracy, Milton and Rose Friedemann classified inherited wealth as an accident of birth, comparable to music, musical talent, that should not be taxed at all. Elsewhere, as we have seen, Milton Friedemann characterized the family motive in wealth transmission as a mysterious force underlying and ultimately animating market freedom, a motive that he found irrational and curious, but to which he nevertheless deferred. These arguments were notable not only because they prioritized the economic role of the family in free market economics, rendering explicit what for the most part remained unsaid or latent, within their theoretical frameworks, but also because they represented a radical departure from the principled merit meritocratic values of early Chicago school neoliberalism. In the 1940s, after all, Milton Friedman's teacher, Henry Simons, 
held views on inherited wealth that were on a continuum with those of McGovern. Going so far as to argue that inheritance and inter vivos gifts should be taxed progressively in the same way as income to ensure a fully meritocratic free market system. In the intervening years, Chicago school neoliberals radicalized their critique of the New Deal welfare state, casting welfare recipients as the true rentiers and parasites of the free market system. And by the 1970s, they had definitively aligned themselves with the interests of bond and stockholders under siege from inflation. Inherited wealth was now reconceived as a necessary spur to the investment energies of the free market. Yet, if the Reagan revolution had presented itself solely as a movement to protect large fortunes, it would no doubt have failed. As Kevin Phillips notes, outright defense of the interests of the idle upper class has rarely managed to mobilize the passions of American populism. Reagan-era ideologues such as George Gilder were therefore not trumpeting inherited wealth, but rather innovation, entrepreneurialism, and risk-taking, even while they waged a covert war on estate taxes and other levies on private fortunes. This mixture of rhetorical meritocracy and political patrimonialism also fueled the conservative populism of the 1970s and radically shifted the class alliances of the late Fordist era. The tax revolt of the 1970s had multiple points of origin, emerging in its early years from both left-wing and right-wing concerns with the redistributive politics of taxation at the local and state level. As it matured, however, and as business interests joined forces with local activists, the movement acquired a distinctly nativist tone that was heavily coded by race. By the time of its first major ballot box success, the passage of California's Proposition 13 in 1978, the movement was almost exclusively associated with white suburban homeowners in revolt against income transfers to the poor. It was this pop it was this popular uprising against the redistributive welfare state more than the machinations of wealthy investors that ultimately made the Reagan revolution possible. The vigor of the tax revolt was astounding, not least because its prime demographic middle-class homeowners had made outright gains from inflation. Yet even as they saw the value of their homes double or triple in the space of a few years, Many of, these home, many of these owner occupiers experienced the recent windfalls of wealth as precarious. Most of them had been pushed into higher tax brackets as a result of inflation and progressive tax reform and resented the fact that their rising property taxes were being squandered on the non-working, non-white poor. Their fears extended from local and state property taxes to the estate tax which they denounced as a subterfuge serving to undermine the family itself. Johnson's Great Society programs had been successful as long as the working and welfare classes felt their interests to be somehow aligned, as unemployment increased and affirmative action programs continued to be rolled out. This fragile coalition broke down and white homeowners began to shift their allegiances toward the wealth-holding classes. The latter, it is true, had objective cause to fear inflation, but it was middle-class homeowners, not investors or bondholders, who took the initiative in defending patrimonial wealth against the redistributive functions of the welfare state. Thus, if neoliberals and supply-siders could express their defense of inherited wealth only in the most circuitous and coded of language, middle-class homeowners had no such reservations and launched an open assault on estate taxes in what was to prove a long-term victory for the super-rich. As one spokesman of the tax revolt expressed it, the estate tax has become increasingly traumatic to the family of modest means. We do not want an estate tax to behave as a punitive tax that destroys the average family's ability to retain a small family farm or business. We do not want an estate tax that destroys the continuity of the economic unit owned by persons of modest means who would, who would like to pass that heritage to either their spouse or lineal descendants.
At a time when redistributive social welfare, rising public investment, and progressive taxation policies were attenuating the force of private familial wealth, white taxpayers recoiled in fear, preferring to claim their allegiance to a much older tradition of inherited wealth invested in the home. In the latter part of the 1970s, then, the white middle class effectively refashioned itself in the image of the patrimonial investment class and sought to exempt itself from forms of social redistribution that were now commonly denounced as subsidies to the family dysfunction of the the poor. By articulating a defense of the private family as economic institution against the redistributive functions of the welfare state, the conservative populism of the 1970s provided the template for the fiscal and monetary politics of the Reagan era and beyond. As the language of the taxpayer revolt makes clear, the neoliberal counter-revolution was intimately informed by a concern with private family wealth and its transmission. Financialization um, Financialization Asset price inflation, and the, tr- the return of inherited wealth. Despite the gathering era of crisis, the 1970s was a decade in which political decisions remained in suspense, blocked by the sheer deadlock of social antagonisms and the still powerful influence of the progressive left. Throughout the decade, Federal Reserve Chairman Arthur Burns continued to accommodate inflation with low interest rates, even as he recognized the threat it imposed to investors. But as the interests of bondholders and homeowners began to converge in the late 1970s, the Federal Reserve was emboldened to intervene decisively in favor of the investor class. Thus, when Paul Volcker replaced Arthur Burns as chair of the Federal Reserve in 1978, he immediately set about implementing Milton Friedman's prescription for dealing with inflation by restricting the money supply and pushing up interest rates. Volcker's monetarism was more strategic than sincere. Nevertheless, it had the desired effect of producing the deepest recession since the Great Depression, replete with double-digit rates of unemployment. Having thus broken the bargaining power of unionized labor, the Volcker shock laid the ground for, laid the ground for a long-term restructuring of the U.S. labor market. Manufacturers were now free to move production units offshore and cut wages to domestic workers, while the high interest rates that were maintained for the duration of Volcker's term brought cheap imports flooding into the, co- into the country, putting an end to rising consumer prices. By 1982, the Federal Reserve appeared to have defeated wage and consumer price inflation, and more important, perhaps, it had proven to bond holders that it was willing to do everything in its power to protect the value of financial assets. The Volcker shock heralded a paradigm shift in American fiscal and monetary policy. Throughout the post-war period, the Federal Reserve adopted a monetary policy serving to indulge the expansionary fiscal stratagems of Keynesian demand management. Its remit, as outlined in the Employment Act of 1946, was to promote maximum employment, production, and purchasing power. Within this policy regime, wage and price inflation were understood as signs of economic growth and benign trade-offs to full employment, a common-sense understanding that was encapsulated in the so-called Phillips curve. The Volcker shock overturned this formula by turning inflation targeting into the prime, prime objective of monetary policy, Henceforth, the central bank would demonstrate its independence from potentially profligate governments by steadfastly disciplining wage and consumer price inflation, whatever the social costs. This signaled a complete turnaround with respect to the 1970s when bondholders had seen the value of their assets depreciate as the Federal Reserve repeatedly deferred to the interests of unionized labor and welfare constituencies. Under the new monetary regime initiated by Volcker, the Federal Reserve spoke directly to the sensibilities of bondholders and sought to maintain their confidence by actively disciplining the policy choices of the state. If the government indulged in excessive social spending, interest rates would be raised. If it imposed fiscal austerity on wages and welfare, the central bank would accommodate with low interest rates. 
In short, if the Fed had once sacrificed the value of assets for wage inflation and now strove to repress wages and consumer prices in the service of asset price appreciation. The monetary priorities of the late Keynesian era had been completely reversed. The macroeconomic consequences of this new monetary regime were quick to declare themselves. By the mid-1980s, when Volcker finally eased up on interest rates, bond and stock prices began a dizzying ascent. Over the following years, bond prices would experience one of the longest bull markets in history, while the Dow Jones embarked while the Dow Jones embarked on a 15-year boom to be followed by the house price appreciation of the early 21st century. Together, these asset price booms generated enormous growth in capital gains and interest payments. The sustained appreciation of financial assets, sometimes glossed in the political ec- economy literature as financialization, led to a sharp turnaround in the distribution of national income. Epstein and Jadev note that in many countries, the share of national income flowing to financial investors went from negative or stagnant in the 1970s to substantially positive in the 1980s. In the UK, the adjusted share was negative 4.21% in the 1970s and 7.3% in the 1980s. In the US, the share was 3.99% in the 1970s and 22.11% in the 1980s, obviously a huge share, while Labour's share of national income declined proportionately. Having entered, office, having entered office at a time when Volcker was remaking monetary policy at the Federal Reserve, Reagan set about work on the fiscal front, skillfully leveraging the passions of the anti-tax movement to push through with reforms that were much more comprehensive and regressive than those imagined by, by an unwitting coalition of middle-class homeowners. Under the influence of neoliberals and supply-siders, who argued that lower taxes on the rich would free up private investment, Reagan initiated a long-term Republican campaign against progressive taxation that would culminate with George W. Bush's attempt to phase out the estate tax in 2001. Under Reagan, the top personal tax bracket was slashed from 70% to 28% in seven years, yielding impressive gains for the top 1-5% to of wage earners. The Economic Tax Recovery Act, passed by Congress in 1981, raised the exemption threshold on the estate tax, reducing the number of estates that owed any taxes at all to less than 1% by the end of the decade. It also extended tax cuts to capital gains and the unearned income derived from financial assets, income, dividends, and rents. These reforms were calculated to benefit the very top percentile of households, and were enacted at a time when Congress was simultaneously letting Social Security taxes rise, a move that cancelled out the effect of income tax reductions for the middle class. Households below the top decile were disproportionately burdened by Social Security contributions and therefore ended up paying higher overall tax rates, notwithstanding the much-celebrated cuts to their income taxes. If Social Security had played a redistributive and equalizing role in the 1970s then, blunting the effects of inherited wealth on relative life chances, it now seemed to be accentuating class distinctions by increasing the burdens on the poor. The Reagan-era revolution in fiscal and monetary policy had a dramatic effect on wealth and income inequality, effectively reversing the accelerated redistributive trends of the 1970s. It was at this point that average wage enter- wages entered a long period of stagnation, a trend that was barely dented by the economic boom of the 1990s. A closer zoom reveals a more extreme picture of income divergence. Beginning in the 1980s, the real hourly wages of male workers fell at the bottom of the income scale, stagnated near the middle, and rose near the top, precipitously so among the top 1%. Women's wages remained at an overall lower level than those of men, 
but followed a similarly skewed skewed pattern of re of skewed pattern of distribution. Even when productivity and corporate profits picked up in the latter part of the 1990s, prompting some economists to celebrate the arrival of a new economy based on human capital investment and knowledge work, average wages continued to stagnate. These trends stand in stark contrast to the golden age of American capitalism from 1947 to 1973, when wages for white male workers kept pace with productivity, growth, and wage, and capital shares of national income remained stable. The effects on wealth distribution, however, were even more striking as asset prices began a ver- vertiginous, vertiginous upward spiral around 1982. The super-rich experienced staggering increases in wealth while the average wealth holding of the lower classes declined in real terms. With many households now reporting zero or negative assets, by 1983, wealth concentration had reverted to its 1962 level and by the end of the decade had plummeted to levels comparable to 1929. It has subsequently remained virtually unchanged. The new monetary... The new monetary regime, ushered in by Volcker, favored those forms of wealth that were held disproportionately by the richest household, or richest households, financial assets such as stocks, bonds, time deposits, and money market funds, all of which saw substantial price appreciation during, during this period. Wolf attributed much of the wealth concentration of the 1980s and beyond to the appreciation of existing stocks of wealth that is, to capital gains on assets acquired in the past. Observing that those who derived income from labor could not hope to accumulate comparable levels of wealth from stagnant or depreciating wages. Promoting asset price inflation at the expense of wage growth, the Federal Reserve's new monetary policy placed a premium on established wealth and returned inheritance to a decisive position in the shaping of social class. The overall effect of neoliberal monetary policy has been to reverse the relationship between wage and asset inflation that prevailed in the post-war era. Throughout the 1970s, wages and welfare kept pace with consumer price inflation as assets plummeted in value, tending to blunt but not erase the force of inherited wealth in shaping social inequality. After 1982, however, wages and welfare struggled to keep pace with anemic levels of consumer price inflation, while the asset-based holdings of the richest households went up and up. Under these circumstances, it was inevitable that family wealth transmission, in which I include both transfers at death and so-called inter vivos transfers, would once again assume a pivotal role in the production of social class. Far from a terminal decline of inheritance, then, the last few decades have witnessed the phenomenal resurgence of large family fortunes, a fact that is confirmed by a newly thriving business and family trusts, a legal instrument traditionally favored by the wealthiest households. More important, perhaps, the relative weight of wealth as opposed to wages in shaping social mobility has increased at all levels of the social scale. Today, it could be argued traditional work-based definitions of class must be corrected for wealth holdings if one is to gain a precise sense of a person's net worth. In the words of Thomas Piketty, inherited wealth comes close to being as decisive at the beginning of the 21st century as it was in the age of Balzac's Pad Goriot. The effect, moreover, has been compounded by cutbacks to public education, health care, and other social services, which have progressively transferred costs back to the private family and compelled parents to take on debt on behalf of their children. The appreciation of house prices, itself a symptom of asset inflation, means that access to home ownership often depends on a loan or gift from parents. The de facto privatization of education and rise in student fees means that a student wanting to pursue a college education is now more directly dependent on the wealth of his or her parents than at any time in the recent past. While the absence of familial wealth can condemn a young person to a life of revolving debt, 
The shift from public spending to private deficit spending as a means of financing investments in human capital, such as health and education, has been well documented in the critical literature on neoliberal financialization. Less noted, however, is the fact that private deficit spending or privatized Keynesianism, as it is sometimes called, almost invariably takes the form of intergenerational parental investment where the family becomes the primary source of economic welfare for those born into a world of ever-diminishing public goods. It is in the specific form of spiraling household debt that neoliberal capitalism has revived the poor law imperative of family responsibility. It would be misleading, however, to suggest that this period has been completely devoid of social democratic interventions. In fact, the idea that the wealth effect could be democratized through the inclusion of middle and low income earners in the logic of financial asset inflation represents one of the central policy innovations of the neoliberal era and one that has been embraced by both sides of the political spectrum. The idea finds inspiration in the tradition of property owning democracy propounded variously by Thomas Paine and John Rawls. In mid 20th century Britain, it was embraced by early members of the neoliberal Mont Pelerin Society and the right wing of the Labour Party as an, ew, as an alternative to state investment in public assets. Variations on the theme have been propounded by left and right and have gone under many names from Drucker's pension fund socialism to stakeholder capitalism, from right, from right wing theories of empowerment to the Ford Foundation's asset based welfare, and finally to George W. Bush's ownership society. The distribution of asset ownership did in fact change significantly after the Reagan revolution as workers were encouraged to entrust their pension savings to the investment strategies of mutual funds. Individual pension accounts such as 401ks exploded after 1982, the period of ver veridic ver ver uh, vertiginous stock price appreciation, which followed the Volcker shock when their promise of rising returns stood in stark contrast to the troubled state of the public pension program. Neoliberals and libertarians understood the migration from social security to individual investment accounts as the most effective way of neutralizing the divide between worker and investor, thereby preempting any possible opposition to neoliberal labor reform. After all, why would worker investors continue to support public services and progressive income taxes if they too had a stake in the appreciation of financial assets? But further than this, the champions of so social security privatization explicitly sold these instruments as vehicles of familial wealth accumulation. Unlike social security benefits, it was argued, the wealth invested in stocks was inheritable and would therefore serve to strengthen rather than undermine the bonds of family dependence. More recently, policymakers have called on home ownership to play a similar role in the generalization of private wealth accumulation. In a period when wages were barely stagnant, the prospect that low income households might also benefit from the dynamics of asset price appreciation through expanded access to mortgages has been key to achieving a certain level of social consensus. A decade or so before it was embraced in the United States, social policy theorists in Britain were celebrating the genius of the Thatcher administration, whose strategies to push the working class toward private home ownership seemed to have undermined the entrenched class hostilities of a previous era. The British Australian sociologist Peter Saunders depicted private home ownership as a form of familial accumulation that would teach the working class the value of inherited wealth and wean them off public services, in the long run perhaps completely altering their traditional political allegiances. What had come to fruition under Thatcher, he argued, was a new form of property-owning democracy powered by asset appreciation and family bequests rather than savings. The present generation will not simply leave a lot of money to its children, but many of them, 
will themselves inherit substantial sums from their parents. Capital gains from the housing markets are, in this sense, becoming cyclical, for each generation here on will, on will benefit from here on will benefit from its parents, while in turn benefiting its children. In the United States, similar ideas would be promoted by third-way advocates of asset-based welfare under Clinton and Republican champions of the ownership society under George W. Bush. The American experiment in neoliberal home ownership policy, however, was always haunted by the specific legacy of the tax revolt. If the tax resistors of the 1970s sought to opt out of the redistributive economics of the welfare state by turning to the resources of familial wealth accumulation, this pathway to economic security was later offered to America's minorities as a way of offsetting their steady decline in income. Where American minorities, both sexual and racial, were once denied the, pr the privileges of inheritable wealth, they were now exhorted to embrace the economic family as the only path towards social inclusion. The subsequent reshuffling of political allegiances has played out in sometimes unexpected ways in recent struggles around the death tax or tax on inheritance. <clears throat> Clinton, home ownership, and the democratization of credit. The Clinton administration was the first to actively promote the idea of minority home ownership as a long-term structural response to the widening social inequalities of neoliberal America. This policy choice was influenced by the work of third-way social reformers who in the 1990s put forward the idea of asset-based welfare as an alternative to traditional forms of social, we social welfare. One of the most influential exponents of asset-based welfare was Michael Sheridan, an, an academic based at Washington University in St. Louis, who argued that traditional welfare programs focused unduly on the problem of income redistribution at the expense of asset ownership. In an era where asset prices were moving ever upward and wages were stagnating, it no longer made sense to distribute welfare in the form of income transfers. Traditional welfare programs such as AFDC, Sheridan contended, disempowered the poor because they focused on the consumption of services, not the generation of private wealth through investment in assets. The means tests that had hitherto limited asset ownership among welfare recipients should therefore be lifted and replaced by active programs of asset democratization. During the 1990s, asset-based welfare was embraced by both the Ford Foundation and the Democratic Leadership Council, the organization that represented centrist or third-way New Democrats such as Bill Clinton. Under Clinton, this preference flowered into a national home ownership strategy that identified private housing as the, as the ideal vector of asset-based investment and general alternative to the diminishing returns of the welfare state. Launched in 1995, Clinton's home ownership strategy was informed by many of the same ideals as the welfare reform agenda he would implement in the following years. The newly appointed director of the, of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, Henry Cisneros, noted that Clinton was intent on ending public housing as we know it, in much the same way as he had vowed to end welfare. Both policy reforms rested on the premise that the welfare poor needed to be weaned off income transfers with all their perverse and demoralizing effects, and instead made responsible for their own economic security. Both assumed that the private family would need to be rehabilitated as the proper legal and moral institution to achieve this goal. You want to reinforce family values in America, encourage two-parent households, get people to stay home? Clinton asked. Make it easy for people to own their own homes and enjoy the rewards of family life and see their work rewarded. Unlike Clinton's welfare reform, however, the National Homeownership Strategy outlined a comprehensive alternative pathway for achieving the poor law imperative of family responsibility, one that relied on credit and asset appreciation rather than the traditional virtues of hard work and savings to render citizens independent of the state. Having vowed to reduce the federal budget deficit to zero, Clinton followed the example of Reagan and George H.W. Bush in slashing federal outlays for public housing. In 
limiting rent control and pushing for the voucher voucherization of state subsidized rentals. During the first few years of his administration, federal spending on services for the homeless fell even further than it had under Reagan, with devastating consequences for the urban poor. But Clinton offered something the Republicans had not, a comprehensive new urban empowerment strategy that reinvigorated the much maligned HUD and shifted its focus from public housing to private home ownership. The Republicans had spent many years attacking HUD, the agency responsible for expanding public housing under Johnson's Great Society, and were threatening to eliminate it completely. Clinton managed to trump the Republicans by repopulating HUD with proponents of asset-based welfare and investing it with a new task, that of extending the benefits of private home ownership to those who were still excluded from the American dream. Housing data collected in the 1980s showed that home ownership rates had stalled for the first time in over two decades and had declined among African American and Latino households. Hoping to reverse these trends, HUD now enlisted the help of the Fannie Mae, Freddie, Freddie Mac, and private mortgage brokers to expand credit options to non conforming borrowers, typically minorities, women, and the young who frequently did not have the regular work history or credit profile required of standard borrowers. Under Clinton's instruction, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were encouraged to relax their underwriting criteria, while the Community Reinvestment Act of 1977, originally introduced to police redlining, was vested with greater power, powers of enforcement. Thus, Clinton promised to redeem America's most disadvantaged citizens, those who had fallen even farther behind in the cruel 1980s, by including them in the slipstream of ever-appreciating asset prices. If Clinton had nursed any skepticism about pursuing such a policy at the beginning of his term in office, he was more or less forced there by the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Alan Greenspan, who counseled that any attempt to raise wages or expand public investment would set off fears of inflation and increase the long-term interest rates or inflation premium demanded by bondholders. In Greenspan's opinion, a better alternative was to scale back government spending, repress wages, and instead let long-term interest rates fall, a process that was sure to generate an abundance of cheap consumer credit. As long as the government took advantage of this credit boom to push the income poor to invest in housing, a virtuous circle, circle would materialize, whereby cheap credit would push up housing prices, which would in turn provide ever-appreciating collateral for the extension of further credit, rather than return to a discredited politics of social investment, an option that would in any case be blocked at every turn by the Federal Reserve. Greenspan urged Clinton to generalize the wealth effect of asset appreciation by relaxing the rules on credit. The virtues of structured finance, including new, more risk-sensitive forms of, of securitization, would in the meantime enable mortgage brokers and investors to extract maximum profit while perfectly hedging the attendant default and liquidity risks of long-term lending. Eugene Ludwig, Clinton's comptroller of the currency, hailed this strategy as the democratization of credit and described it as the final completion of a democratic process initiated under the New Deal, but hitherto compromised by its normative exclusions. Because of the democratization of credit, he observed, yesterday's underserved have become today's core business customers. The federal politics of post-war credit expansion that had enabled millions of middle-class white Americans to purchase homes would now at last be extended to Fordism's non-normative subjects, minorities, women, and other dubious credit risks. Having been historically marginalized from accumulation of private wealth, they too would now be inducted into the logic of asset accumulation, if only in the perspective and aspirational form of revolving debt.